Philo of Alexandria and Allegorical Interpretation of the Bible. Although Philo of Alexandria lived 2000 years ago, his thought and writings are very relevant today. Philo is a leading figure in the allegorical interpretation of the Bible. This talk will introduce Philo, his works, and his methods. Our main intended audience is religious practitioners, Christians, Jews, and members of other faiths. Secondarily it is intended for those with interests in psychology and mythology. The Bible is a profound text, a pearl of great price. To fully understand its moral and spiritual meaning, one must understand the language it uses. The language of the Old Testament is symbolism and allegory. However because allegorical interpretation can be misused, it's important to have a reliable figure like Philo to show us how to do it correctly. We'll see that Philo also illumines our knowledge of the human mind. Unlike modern psychology, the Bible recognizes that a moral and spiritual perspective is necessary for a complete understanding of who we are, and how we can achieve happiness and self-realization. Philo's writings are relevant to several modern trends. Within Christianity, literalism has reached an impasse, and we are seeing renewed interest in interpreting the Old Testament symbolically. There is also growing interest in the virtue ethics of Greek philosophy, especially Stoicism and Platonism. Philo is an important spokesman for both philosophical traditions. Further, as the problems of materialism are today becoming ever more apparent, we are seeing renewed interest in contemplation, transcendence and spirituality as means to find meaning and happiness. These subjects are addressed by Philo, and in ways that can be easily applied to enhance modern theories of psychology. Finally, by helping us to understand the Bible's message in objective and scientific terms, Philo's writings can promote dialogue between Christians. Jews, and members of other religions. Philo of Alexandria, or Philo Judaeus, as he is also called, was a Jewish philosopher who lived in Alexandria, Egypt, from about 20 BC to 50 AD. He was a devout and practicing Jew, active in the religious affairs of his community. As a Hellenized Jew, he wrote in Greek and used the Septuagint Greek Bible, which had been previously translated in Alexandria. Philo came from a well-to-do family. His brother was extremely wealthy and his nephew married the daughter of Herod Agrippa. A prominent and respected figure, Philo led a delegation to the Emperor Caligula in Rome in response to oppressive policies against the Jews of Alexandria. This timeline puts Philo into historical perspective. We can see that just before Philo's birth the tumultuous end of the Roman Republic, marked by the assassinations of Julius Caesar and Cicero and the intrigues of Mark Antony and Cleopatra, had concluded. Octavian, also called Augustus, became the first Roman emperor. The Pax Romana was underway. We also see that Philo was an older contemporary of St. Paul, a fact to which we will return. Philo commands our attention as a trusted authority on Bible interpretation. All subsequent Christian allegorical interpretation, a long and venerable tradition that includes many of the greatest Christian theologians, derives from Philo's work. Philo was a first-rate Platonist philosopher. By combining Platonic philosophy with the Jewish tradition he made many important innovations. But Philo also needs to be recognized as a spiritual master. His works abound in passages that hint at his own spiritual experiences. Philo fits the mold of an ancient Jewish prophet. If we consider, say, the unknown editor of the book of Isaiah, he might have been someone much like Philo, educated, biased, spiritually advanced, and yet prosperous enough to collect manuscripts and with sufficient time for scholarship and writing. In former times, it was even suggested that Philo wrote the Old Testament book called Wisdom. While that's probably not true, the point is that Philo was just the kind of person we'd expect to have written it. Partly because he wrote in Greek, Philo's work was ignored by the Jewish rabbinical tradition. Jewish interpretation inclined towards Midrash, not allegory. It was Christians who preserved Philo's works and adopted his methods. So ironically, Philo, 
a Jew, is the father of Christian allegorical interpretation. His works influenced Alexandrian Christian fathers like Clement and Origen. From these, Philo's methods passed to Gregory of Nyssa and the other Cappadocian fathers, and then to Byzantine Christianity. In the Latin West, St. Jerome read Philo and adopted his allegorical approach. St. Ambrose included long paraphrases of Philo in his works. Ambrose's writings, in turn, influenced his pupil, St. Augustine. Ambrose and St. Augustine set the tone for all later allegorical interpretation during the Middle Ages, a vast literature, and the Renaissance. But because they seldom if ever mentioned Philo by name, he was unknown to the later writers, even though they were continuing a tradition begun by him. Let's look briefly at his historical context. Alexandria, founded in 330 BC by Alexander the Great, was one of several cities in the ancient world with large Jewish populations. There were already Jews living in Egypt before Alexander arrived. But they were particularly welcomed in Alexandria, which was intended from the start to be an ethnically diverse and cosmopolitan city. This is a map of Alexandria around the time of Philo. As seen, a large island, Pharos, connected to the mainland by a causeway, created two separate harbors. At the base of the peninsula in the north was the palace complex and the nearby library. To the south is Lake Mariates, along the shore of which was an enclave of monastics, whom Philo describes in his work, On the Contemplative Life. Besides its famous lighthouse, ancient Alexandria was renowned for having the greatest library of its time. It's said that a Ptolemaic king of Egypt mandated that every ship entering the port of Alexandria had to take any books it carried to the library, where they were copied. The library and a parallel institution, the museum, drew scholars from around the ancient world. Important areas of research included astronomy, geometry and literature. There, the modern editions of Homer's works were collated and edited. Homer's works were allegorically interpreted, and this approach was extended by Philo and other Jewish scholars to the Old Testament. Alexandria also boasted a rich cultural life that included theater, musical performances and athletic events. As a Hellenized and cultured Jew, Philo eagerly availed himself of all these opportunities. Given Philo's location, it's not surprising that he was influenced by many sources. These include his Jewish tradition, the dominant Greek philosophies of the times, especially Platonism and Stoicism, and, just possibly, remaining elements of ancient Egyptian religion. Here we'll mainly consider Philo's Platonist and Stoic roots. St. Jerome relates an ancient saying that either Philo Platonizes or Plato Philonizes. This comparison to Plato is high praise indeed. It refers to a similarity not only in their subject matter, but also their lofty and well crafted literary style. Plato, of course, had lived several centuries before Philo. For our purposes, the most important parts of Plato's doctrines are his ethical, psychological, and religious teachings. Plato proposed a tripartite model of the soul, which we'll look at in the next slide. He understood happiness to involve an ascent of the mind and soul away from transient, material things, the realm of becoming, as he called it, to eternal and spiritual concerns, or true being. Eventually, through practices and a lifestyle he called philosophy, or the love of wisdom, Plato believed a person might achieve the beatific vision, a sight of God, the source of all goodness. Another central tenet of Platonism is the belief in the immortality of the human soul. One of Plato's important contributions to philosophy is his tripartite or three-part model of the human soul. The three parts are the rational, the appetitive, and the spirited. The rational part contains our intellectual powers, including pure intellection, by which we immediately grasp principles and relations and ratiocination or discursive reasoning. The appetitive part contains such physical drives as those for food, drink and sex. The spirited element includes our social drives, such as those for fame and respect, dominance, and anger. Together the appetitive and spirited parts are called the passions, or the irrational part of the soul. 
in the well-ordered soul, the intellectual part controls the passions, moderating and harmonizing them so that they stay within reasonable bounds and don't conflict with each other, on with the demands of reality. However when the rational part doesn't do its work properly, the passions dominate. This leads not only to various vices, but also to the myriad forms of negative emotions and thoughts that plague us. For Plato, it is philosophy's task to reconstruct the soul so that the passions are properly subordinated to the rule of reason. This requires virtues like temperance, righteousness and courage, and the acquisition of wisdom, which, for Plato, is something beyond mere practical knowledge, but more like a capacity for spiritual insight. In his dialogue, the Phaedrus, Plato famously likened this tripartite model to a chariot drawn by two horses. The horses, one dark and one white, correspond to the appetitive and spirited passions, respectively, and the chariot driver to the rational mind. When the driver does his job, the chariot soars upward to behold heavenly sights, this is wisdom and an opening of the spiritual eye. But if the driver is lazy or inattentive, the horses take control, running amok, and the chariot falls, crashing to the ground. Hence Plato sees the human mind as always either rising towards heavenly thoughts and virtue, or falling into vice and confusion. As much as possible, we need to keep on the upward path, and this is the purpose of philosophy and religion. Along with other elements of Platonism, Philo adopts the tripartite model fully, and even mentions the chariot analogy in his works. Not long after Plato's death, his successors revised his theories. Misunderstanding Socratic ignorance, they took the view that certainty of any kind was impossible, so one had to remain skeptical about everything. This ignored the original center of Plato's teachings, which placed more emphasis on virtue and wisdom. During this skeptical phase of Platonism, Stoicism arose and took up the cause of virtue ethics. Like Plato, Stoics emphasized the importance of controlling passions. However they lacked Plato's mystical dimension. Rather than see it as a means of spiritual ascent, Stoics sought to control passions merely to attain a tranquil mind, a state called apathia, or dispassion. The Stoics are also noteworthy for their progressive social philosophy, which emphasized the common family of humankind. The ethical ideal for Stoics was to become a sage or wise person, who lived entirely in harmony with nature. By Philo's time, however, Platonism had abandoned its skeptical phase, and was returning to Plato's original teachings. Gradually, Platonism and Stoicism, along with Aristotle's teachings, began to merge. This was the eclectic milieu in which Philo operated. Though their lives overlapped in time, it's unlikely that Philo and St. Paul ever met. Philo died before Paul's letters were written, and there is no evidence that Paul read Philo, though he may have heard of him. Nevertheless, they had much in common. Both were pious, practicing Jews. Both were Hellenized, though Philo more so. Both wrote in Greek, and both were strongly influenced by Stoic ethics. They were operating, then, in the same intellectual environment, with similar influences, and similar audiences. Therefore their writings are reciprocally illuminating, each shedding light on the other. St. Paul, the more brilliant writer, able to express in a single sentence what might take Philo several chapters to say, is an ideal lens through which to view Philo. Especially relevant here is St. Paul's letter to the Romans, with its Stoic-inspired references to the struggle between what he called carnal-mindedness and spiritual-mindedness. Stoics understood this as the conflict between the rational mind and the passions, and Platonists as the struggle of the mind to ascend to eternal things rather than fall into worldliness. All agreed that this is the central ethical conflict upon which our happiness, welfare, moral condition and mental integrity depend. Philo's main purpose is to show how this struggle is portrayed allegorically in the stories of the Old Testament. What is carnal mindedness? What is spiritual mindedness? How is the victory and our salvation attained? What requires our own efforts, and what depends on grace? These are the questions that St. Paul and Philo both pose. Philo finds the answers in the Old Testament, seeing it as containing a blueprint for renewal and salvation. But allegorical interpretation, he believes, is essential to understanding this message.
the works of Philo can be grouped into four categories. First are his allegorical commentaries on Genesis. These are his most important works, and what we're concerned with here. They are a more or less continuous exegesis on Genesis from the beginning to end, plus two summaries, sets of questions and short answers, one of these covers Genesis, and another, that we won't discuss here, Exodus. Clearly this falls short of a commentary on the entire Old Testament, but that's not really a problem. Most themes in the Old Testament are addressed in Genesis. By learning Philo's allegorical method as applied there, we can extend it ourselves to the rest of the Bible. This is better, because it profits us much more to find meanings on our own. Philo's allegorical works do vary somewhat in quality. The best are shown here with an asterisk. Philo wrote a shorter cycle of biographical and legal works that have a somewhat less allegorical emphasis. Some of these may have been written to explain Judaism to non-Jewish readers. We also have a couple of general ethical treatises by Philo, and miscellaneous works of an autobiographical nature. In one of the latter, On the Contemplative Life, Philo describes a monastic sect he sometimes visited, the Therapeutae. In another, he writes about his mission to the Emperor Gaius Caligula. This and the next slide consider Philo's hermeneutical assumptions. The word hermeneutics derives from Hermes, the Greek god associated with communication, and refers to the model and principles assumed to govern how meaning is encoded in scripture, and how to decode it. First, Philo accepts that the Old Testament is the revealed word of God, written for our spiritual reformation and advancement. Every word is divinely inspired. There are no accidents or mistakes in phrasings. For example, if some word in a verse is repeated, either in the same or slightly altered form, Philo sees this as a sign of a subtle distinction that requires allegorical interpretation. Sometimes Philo accepts literal meanings, and other times not, but in either case he's always interested in deeper meanings. To avoid idiosyncratic interpretations, Philo stays close to his main theoretical assumption, that our moral and spiritual reformation conforms to Platonic anthropology and Stoic ethics. These can be understood as a system of ascetico-mysticism, with the three characteristic stages of purgation or purification, illumination, and eventually union with God. His adherence to this model means that Philo's interpretations never stretch credulity too much, and are helpful even when they might not reflect the exact intentions of the Bible's authors. On the other hand, Philo often uses etymological analysis of names as a starting point. These tend to be hit or miss, sometimes surprisingly good, sometimes not so. In some works Philo, who also had an interest in Pythagoreanism, resorts to numerological interpretations. These are less persuasive than his etymologies, but are never central to his main arguments and can be safely ignored. Philo's allegorical model works basically by the principle of personification. As Emile Schurer puts it, for Philo, Genesis, and, by extension, the rest of the Old Testament, quote, is in reality nothing else than a system of psychology and ethic. The different individuals denote the different states of soul. To analyze these is the special aim of this great allegorical commentary. This produces what we might call an archetypal psychology of the Bible. The theory of archetypes, associated with the psychiatrist Carl Jung, has been used to interpret the psychological meaning of myths, dreams and literary works. Archetypes are Jung's term for psychological patterns or complexes that occur universally in human beings and explain how much of our thinking is organized. Jung, incidentally, adopted the term archetype from Philo. Two thousand years before Jung Philo argued that each major figure in the Old Testament and every main situation had its counterpart in a psychological archetype. Our minds operate somewhat as a network of these interacting dispositions or complexes. Unlike Jung, Philo saw a definite moral trajectory to all this. Ultimately, if we cooperate with God and grace, by following the patterns and energies of the positive archetypes of our mind, we can reach spiritual maturity and personality integration. 
This archetypal perspective is perhaps helpful to consider, but it isn't necessary to understand and apply Philo's theories about the Bible. On the creation of the world. Let's look more closely at Philo's main contribution, his great allegorical commentary on Genesis, which contains about 20 separate works. We'll very briefly note the key themes of each. Editions of Philo's allegorical commentary traditionally begin with On the Creation of the World. The modern view, though, is that this work doesn't belong here. It seems more closely related to Philo's legal commentaries, and is perhaps an introduction to them. We can pass it by, then, except to note that it reveals some of Philo's ideas about metaphysics and theology, such as the nature of God. Allegorical Interpretation Philo's work titled Allegorical Interpretation, his best work, is where he lays the groundwork for all subsequent discussion. It presents his insightful and valuable analysis of the human condition. The human mind, for Philo, is symbolized by the combination of Adam, our intellect, and Eve, our sensate and emotional nature. The mind is intended to dwell in a garden of Eden of beautiful and holy thoughts. This happens as long as Eve is subordinate to Adam, remaining his helpmate. Then we have not only good thoughts, but our sensations and emotions are positive, too. The problem comes when pleasure, or, rather, attachment to pleasure, enters the scene, symbolized by the serpent. This serpent entices Eve to cling to the pleasures of sensation, and no longer maintain her full loyalty to Adam. This, the proverbial fall of us old, has two broad negative consequences. The first is that our mind is no longer oriented to higher and virtuous things, and so loses the pleasures of contemplation, the fruits of the garden. Second, with the intellect no longer in command, what ought to be an orderly city of us old ascends into chaos and confusion. This is an originating sin in the sense that from it we fall into a cascade of worse conditions. All the rest of Genesis, for Philo, and, for that matter, the entire Old Testament, is a response to this fall, both the further negative consequences, and the steps needed to repair things. On the cherubim. Philo next considers how after the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the garden, God placed cherubims and a flaming sword to prevent their re-entrance. Philo doesn't explore the rich symbolic possibilities here as much as he might, and this book isn't as strong as the preceding and next ones. He does again use the opportunity to investigate God's nature, and introduces Cain, symbol of the carnal and egoistic mind. The Sacrifices of Cain and Abel Next, Philo devotes three books to the story of Cain and Abel. Understood allegorically, Adam, our intellect, and Eve, the sensate and feeling part of our mind, produce two fundamentally different personality orientations. These are Abel, a childlike, kindly and pious disposition, and Cain, selfish and willful. Two attributes that pretty well sum up Cain are self-will and self-love. God accepted Abel's sacrifices, Philo tells us, because they were first fruits. Abel, in whatever he did, kept God foremost in his thoughts. Whereas Abel might be thought of as our true self, Cain is a false self, the essence of what we call egoism. These two personality orientations are in perpetual conflict. Abel, an especially naive version of our true self, is really no match for Cain and is soon killed by him. What we'll see, progressing through Genesis, is the evolution of more effective and resourceful manifestations of our true self, symbolized by various patriarchs, who eventually prevail against our false inner Cain. The worse attacks the better. Not only does Cain compete with, but also sabotages our better nature. This is an important point, because it means we need assistance from some higher power whether a higher self or something outside ourselves for success. The primal struggle within our personality between humility and egoism, virtue and vice is so important that it is symbolized repeatedly throughout the Old Testament. Not just with Cain and Abel, but also with Jacob and Esau, Moses and Pharaoh, Joshua and Amalek, etc. This basic soul conflict or psychomachia is also a prominent theme in mythology. 
it may help to explain why human beings evidently choose maladaptive thoughts and behavior, such as addictive behavior and chronic negative thinking. The Bible may be trying to teach us something very important about this. It recognizes moral and spiritual dimensions of this basic conflict that modern psychology seems reluctant to consider. The Posterity of Cain Philo's psychology can be understood in terms of what's called subpersonality theory. This holds that, while in one sense we are a single person with a single ego, in another sense we have many interacting subpersonalities or sub-egos, that is, a community of selves. Whether taken literally or only as a metaphor, it's a powerful tool for describing and understanding the mind's operation. In Philo's system, each figure in the Bible, good or bad, can be thought of as representing a different actual or potential subpersonality. We also have generations of subpersonalities, as one may evolve over time or produce new ones, the mental equivalents of families and descendants. Subpersonalities construct belief systems, structures analogous to houses and cities, respectively. Cain's descendants, then, could be allegorically understood as offspring of our original Cain like, egoistic personality. Since Cain is a false self, the cities his offspring build are false too, maladaptive and even delusional belief systems that support egoistic and misguided aims. On the Giants In On the Giants, Philo discusses Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. This is where the sons of God find the daughters of men fair, and with them beget giants of the earth. Philo interprets this as another allegory for the platonic fall of the soul, recapitulating the Garden of Eden theme. The sons of God belong to the highest part of the soul, the rational part. The daughters of men symbolize sensual pleasures. Their offspring, giants of the earth, are worldly and carnal-minded dispositions, like Cain. This leads Philo to discuss three classes of men, the earthborn, who are given up to the life of the body, the heavenborn, who cultivate the heavenly part of the soul, the mind, by following secular learning, and the godborn, who have their thoughts fixed on God alone. Philo sees examples of these in the giants, Abraham, and Moses, respectively. God is unchangeable. The next five books of Philo's allegorical commentary concern Noah. These show less brilliance than his other works, and we'll move through them quickly. The first, called on the unchangeableness of God, contains many digressions. It doesn't say much about the flood itself or the ark, except to make the general point that God will overturn the sinful and impious mind. The deluge is a flood of passions, bad judgments and distorted thoughts which God allows to flow unabated. Vice is its own punishment. Philo's Experiences We shouldn't be too concerned that not all Philo's works are of equal quality. He candidly tells us himself that sometimes he simply lacks inspiration. For example, in On the Migrations of Abraham he wrote, I feel no shame in recording my own experience, a thing I know from its having happened to me a thousand times. On some occasions, I have found my understanding incapable of giving birth to a single idea, and had given it up without accomplishing anything, reviling my understanding for its self-conceit. He then goes on to describe episodes of intense inspiration, where it seems he receives spiritual insights, visions and illuminations while almost in an unconscious state. On Husbandry and Noah as a Planter After the Flood Genesis tells us Noah cultivated the earth and made wine. This is discussed in Philo's next two books, which, again, contain much digression. He does make the point that a person needs to work to cultivate virtue in the soul. On Drunkenness and on Sobriety Genesis then relates that Noah got drunk on his wine and fell asleep naked and is discovered by Ham, who tells his two brothers. Again, Philo here is content to digress on various aspects of intoxication and sobriety. The Noah story has many details that are striking and which seem allegorically meaningful, but are so strange it's hard to explain what those meanings are. This raises the general point that there are many subtle details in Genesis we tend to overlook. Philo has a sharp eye for these. 
even when his interpretations aren't convincing, they cause us to notice these details. The Confusion of Tongues Philo returns to form with on the confusion of tongues. This interprets the Tower of Babel story in Genesis. First Philo relates a similar myth, the fable of the animals, one not known from other sources. In this story, all animals originally spoke the same language. This caused them to become proud, the old problem of hubris, and to demand from God that they be made immortal. For this presumption God separated and confounded their languages. Moving on to the Babel myth, Philo sees it as an extension of the impious cities built by Cain's descendants, with the same symbolic meaning. Our impious and self-willed nature creates false edifices of thought, even massive, towering structures. They rival heaven insofar as they become more important to us than religion and spirituality. Not only are these doomed to come tumbling down, but there is also the interesting mediating mechanism of the confusion of languages. We might understand the meaning by returning to subpersonality theory. To build these false edifices requires the cooperation of multiple subpersonalities. In states of mental confusion and distraction, this can't happen effectively. To get even more speculative, we might suggest that something like a higher self, when we are deeply engaged in building such impious towers, allows or causes our minds to become confused, the purpose being to destroy the edifice and bring us back to our good senses. Philo does not say this in so many words, but his discussion might be taken as hinting at something similar. It seems clear in any case that the Tower of Babel myth is addressing some very real and fundamental processes of cognitive psychology, problems that plague our thinking on a daily basis. The broader implication is that the Old Testament is a great deal of valuable information about cognitive psychology. Philo and the Three Patriarchs Philo's treatment of the three patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is extremely noteworthy. We see a coherent architecture linking these books. Philo is not just allegorically interpreting individual verses or stories. He has a sense that there is a unifying purpose and structure to the Old Testament, an evolution of the figures and themes, and one that corresponds to our own soul. These three symbolize, for Philo, three phases of the seeker's quest for truth and holiness. Abraham symbolizes the person or disposition who learns from study, from reading, teachers, science or nature. Isaac, on the other hand, is self-taught, in the sense that he learns moral truths by looking within himself. He epitomizes the philosopher's mandate to know thyself. Jacob, finally, the offspring of Isaac, puts these insights into practice. He is the ascetic, in the full sense of the term as one who works and exercises particular skills to develop morally and spiritually. On the migrations of Abraham Abraham's life is characterized by many travels, from Chaldea to eventually settling in Canaan. Philo sees this as an allegory for spiritual travel and progress. Places like Chaldea, Haran and Egypt are stepping stones and stumbling blocks on this journey. At the beginning, God tells Abraham to leave his father's house, meaning to alienate himself from his body and senses. Chaldea, where Abraham begins, is associated by Philo with astrology, superstition and a view of God as being nothing other than the physical universe. The first place he visits, Huron, symbolizes science and secular philosophy. These are useful, but eventually must also be abandoned for higher realities. Lot, who accompanies Abraham at first, symbolizes a mixed mind that still clings to sensory realities. Eventually Abraham must part ways with him. Who is heir to divine things? When God first calls Abraham, he promises to show him a new land and make of him a great nation. Now Abraham, after traveling a long way, has become an old man, still childless. When God repeats his promises, Abraham wonders where who his descendants will be. Philo explains that a great nation and descendants are meant in a spiritual and moral sense. To quote Philo, for he wished to picture the soul of the sage as the counterpart of heaven, or rather transcending it, a heaven on earth having within it, as the ether has, pure forms of being, movements ordered, rhythmic, harmonious, 
revolving as God directs, rays of virtues, supremely star-like and dazzling. And if it be beyond our powers to count the stars which are visible to the senses, how much more truly can that be said of those which are visible to the mind? On mating and on flight and finding. A main theme of on mating is the meanings of Abraham's wives, Sarah and Hagar. At first, Sarah, who symbolizes virtue, is barren. Therefore she calls on Hagar, symbolizing secular education, who first mates with Abraham. By secular education phyla means the standard classical curriculum of grammar, literature, including poetry and history, music, geometry, rhetoric and dialectic. These prepare the mind to bear virtuous offspring. Besides Sarah and Hagar, its legitimate wives, the mind sometimes has a concubine, vice. In On Flight and Finding, Philo considers the next part of Genesis 16, where Hagar, feeling she's been harshly treated by Sarah, flees into the desert, where she eventually finds a spring and is visited by an angel, who bids her return. Philo uses this passage to investigate the two themes here of flight and finding, which are found throughout Genesis and Exodus. The theme of flight leads to a discussion of the symbolic meaning of the cities of refuge in the Mosaic Law, places to which a person who commits some infraction may journey and find protection. Another example of flight is when Jacob, who, after quarreling with his brother, Esau, flees to his uncle, Laban. Laban symbolizes the man of the sense world, but sometimes this flight is appropriate, because the virtuous man ought to make right use of the things of the material world. Many examples of finding are also discussed. In the desert, Hagar finds a spring. Philo notes that springs and fountains have many meanings in Genesis and Exodus, but the most important is the spring of wisdom, which is what Hagar finds. On the change of names, the ostensible topic of this work is God's changing of Abram's name to Abraham, and Sarai's to Sarah. Philo uses the opportunity to discuss many other examples of changed or dual names, such as Jacob and Israel, Benjamin and Benoni and Jethro and Regal. Philo's interpretations here aren't always convincing, but it is interesting to see how often the motif of double names occurs in the Old Testament. Incidentally, for Philo, Israel means vision of God. The Israelites, therefore, symbolize all those virtuous parts of the soul which are on the true path, which is to obtain a vision of God, understood in a broad sense that also includes seeing his manifestations in the physical world, and recognizing his inner guidance. On Dreams, Book 1. Philo devotes two books to dreams. In Book 1 he discusses two dreams of Jacob. The first is the famous dream of a ladder with ascending and descending angels. Philo uses the opportunity to discuss generally how God communicates and inspires the human mind, a topic of some importance to him. God can communicate with the mind in more than one way, but most commonly this is done by means of mediating logoi. At least some of these logoi are equivalent to angels. However Philo also understands logoi in a more general sense as the individual, we might say. Metaphysical words, spoken by God by which he directs creation, something also found in Stoic metaphysics. This, however, would not explain the ascending angels in Jacob's dream. Philo gives an alternative interpretation which sees the ladder as a symbol for alternating progress and backsliding of the spiritual practicer. Philo then proceeds to a second, less familiar dream of Jacob. This occurs around the time of his flight from Laban the symbol of the sense-oriented mind. In the dream an angel instructs Jacob to divide his sheep into the solid-colored and the speckled. Philo understands these to symbolize holy thoughts, and lower ones, respectively. On Dreams, Book 2 In Book 2 of On Dreams, we now proceed to Joseph. In the Bible story, we recall, first Joseph, one of Jacob's twelve sons is sold into slavery by his brothers, and ends up in Egypt. First he works for a jailer, where he happens to interpret the dreams of the pharaoh's butler and baker. For Philo, pharaoh symbolizes the body and its passions. Joseph eventually becomes the trusted prime minister of the pharaoh. Philo sees here a compromised disposition, that of a politician. 
Joseph is a Hebrew, a virtue seeker, but he makes a deal with Pharaoh, the bodily pleasures. He tries to have the best of both worlds. While this is an attractive proposition, Philo clearly believes that in the end this doesn't work. This book contains Philo's interesting and fertile discussions of three pairs of dreams that Joseph interprets. First are two dreams he had with his brothers, ones that are a bit conceited, at face value, and which Philo associates with Joseph's proclivity for vainglory. Next are the dreams of the butler and the baker, which lead Philo to discuss drunkenness and gluttony. Finally come the dreams of the Pharaoh about seven fat and seven lean cattle, which Joseph interprets as seven coming years of abundance and seven of famine. Philo makes much of the river setting of Pharaoh's dreams. In a very interesting discussion, he sees the mind as at a junction between two rivers, a flow of divine thoughts from above, and a torrent constantly being generated by the passions. The wise person needs to attend to the former. How to read Philo. We do need to say something about how to read Philo. His style is unfamiliar, and that can be frustrating. As already mentioned, Philo tends to be discursive. A detail in one Bible story, a person, say Pharaoh, or a thing, like a stone or spring, leads him to consider references to the same person or thing in other Bible stories, all with the intention of illustrating and elaborating the symbolic meaning. His interpretation of Genesis and Exodus generally has something like a holographic structure. Each part informs our understanding of every other part. So it takes multiple readings of Philo to really appreciate his arguments. It must be emphasized, though, that the effort is worth it. It can be hard work at first, but gets easier. Nevertheless there are some steps that can help. First. Don't simply pick a single work of Philo and expect to read it continuously from start to finish. It's better to focus on particular themes as they're found across his works. Fortunately, volume 10 of the Lobe edition of Philo, shown on the next slide, contains some excellent indices. One helpful approach is to take an Old Testament verse of interest, consult the index to see where Philo cites that, and then read the relevant passages in his various works. Another thing to keep in mind is that one is really trying to understand the Bible, not Philo. So we read along with him more as colleagues than slavish students, and take his interpretations mainly as starting points. He's not always right, and we should always feel free to reject an interpretation. Finally, Philo will make more sense the more one understands Platonic psychology and ethics. For this there is no substitute for reading Plato himself especially his key dialogues like Phaedo, Phaedrus, and the central books of the Republic. Resources The 19th century translation of his works by Charles Duke Young is not the best English version, but it is generally good and is more than satisfactory for most purposes. A particular advantage is that the text from Young's translation is easily available online. The best complete translations of Philo's works were made by Colson, Whitaker, and Marcus, and comprise the ten volumes, plus two supplements, of the Loeb Classical Library edition. This edition includes Greek text as well as English translations on facing pages. Volume 10 of this edition, as already mentioned, includes helpful indices that show where Philo discusses each verse of Genesis and Exodus, and each important person, place or thing. These volumes appeared over several decades, and at least some may now be in the public domain. David Winston edited a one-volume work on Philo. This contains two complete works, on the giants, and on the contemplative life, as well as a large number of key passages from Philo's other works. Unlike many academicians who present Philo in a dry way as someone of mere historical interest, Winston, is more willing to accept Philo as a spiritual teacher with insights relevant for today. Finally, Ken Schenk has written a nice overview of Philo and his works that may serve as an excellent introduction. Thank you for watching this presentation. If you're seeing this on YouTube and found it helpful, please click the like button.